All right, let's talk about some of these other series that have wrapped up, starting with the Lakers and the Nuggets last night. And what was really this was an <laughs> this was an entertaining five game series, much like how the Western Conference Finals last year was an entertaining sweep. And I'm half joking, but I'm also being serious. This series was really great with a lot of close games. The Nuggets just showing that honestly, this season. Just isolating it to this season, the Nuggets might be the best clutch team that I have seen in my life. There's obviously clutch players, players over history that I think are more clutch, but if you're just talking about team execution, taking good shots, locking down on defense, and locking down on all the details when it's time to lock in, I've never seen a team like the Nuggets this year, the 2023-24 Denver Nuggets. And look, honestly, I'm not going to lie with the way the Lakers were playing yesterday and they built up another double digit lead. I kind of thought there was a part of me that thought this was going to be different. LeBron James was spectacular. Anthony Davis in that LeBron James two man game was working. Jokic, I thought all series had trouble defending Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis got whatever he wanted when he was isolated on Jokic or was rolling and diving at the rim right at Jokic or even just in standstill isolation where he could use his pull-up jumper. I really thought Anthony Davis was great in this series, but there's just nothing you could do with the Bear, number 15 in Denver. And I actually thought Jokic had a terrible game yesterday. And what did he end up with? He ended up with 25 points, 20 rebounds, and fucking nine assists. It's just absurd how good this guy is. But Jamal Murray playing with this calf strain, which is one of the underrated storylines that I've developed in the playoffs, is Jamal Murray's health. And hopefully that calf injury does not get worse. But he was spectacular in this game. Really was aggressive to start the game, pull up jumpers, driving to the rim, had a dunk on LeBron late in the game, and Jamal Murray, man, just one of the clutch players in NBA history already. He has cemented himself as that. I've always been a huge Jamal Murray fan. There are times where I thought he could have been an all-star of injuries or a slump here or a slump there. Didn't slow him down. And really... He does need some all-star appearances on his resume. Otherwise, his resume is just going to look weird by the time his career is over. But if you're just talking about playoff performers, he's one of the best to do it. Just straight up. He's one of the best to do it. And he ended the Lakers season. He ended the Lakers in game two. And it just doesn't matter how bad he's shooting. He's always going to show up in the big moments. And I know that's cliche, but it's true. It's this entire Nuggets team. Aaron Gordon gets a big offensive rebound over LeBron James and then kicks it out, I believe, to Michael Porter Jr. for a game-tying three. You just knew that shit was going in. Just like in game two, where Aaron Gordon got a save off of Nikola Jokic trying to foul grift, and he chucked it nearly out of bounds, and Aaron Gordon saved it, threw it right to Michael Porter Jr. for a game-tying three. The Nuggets just know how to make big plays in the biggest moments, whether it's getting a loose ball, scrapping together an extra possession, getting a big defensive stop, holding the fort down defensively. This team is just awesome. And I know the Nuggets haven't played well, particularly in this series, and somehow they still won 4-1 despite leading the series for a total of like 40 minutes or something like that. That's not going to fly with the Timberwolves next round. But on the Lakers side of things, they really turned it around the last two months. I don't know how Laker fans survived watching Darvin Ham all year. I watch Laker games and I'm just like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Is he just going to stand there and watch his team get blasted by a 10-0 run? It was 69-60 to when the Nuggets started making their push. You're in the altitude. Your players clearly look gassed. That Anthony Davis four-point play on Michael Porter Jr., that to me was a direct result of being gassed. And Anthony Davis just did a lazy closeout, wasn't really aware of where he was stepping to or his surroundings. And that was part 
of the big run Denver was on, and Darvin Ham just let all that shit happen without calling the timeout. And look, timeout is a low-hanging fruit criticism for a coach, but it's very clear that Darvin Ham just has no feel for the flow of the game. He did weird shit at the beginning of the regular season, like having Austin Reeves come off the bench, took forever to start Rui. Just a bunch of dumb shit that really put the Lakers behind the eight ball unnecessarily because they ended up being a good team. Like a good offensive team, a good defensive team, but weird lineup choices, just omitting not to call timeouts to stop momentum not giving the ball to Anthony Davis, not running plays to get Anthony Davis the ball on the move in the fourth quarter at least, because you got to get Anthony Davis a touch. He's not going to self-create all the time. Going with three-guard lineups when it's very clear that that was suboptimal, just, I don't know how Laker fans deal with it, but they were a good team, and the Nuggets did have a good test on their hands, because if they had lost that game, boy, would the storylines have gotten interesting but that didn't happen the nuggets once again showed that they have steely resolve when it comes to crunch time and now we have a fun series ahead of us let's real quickly go to pelicans thunder because i'll be honest i feel like a lot of people didn't watch this series i watched the first three games i was watching celtics heat and i was watching Lakers Nuggets was more interested in that I did watch some of the fourth quarter of Pelicans Thunder yesterday and actually my takeaway is because I had Pelicans Thunder on the other screen my takeaway is Jalen Williams I already made a video about it but he's going to be more than a star I don't think the star label is proper for what we think Jalen Williams ceiling could be he's going to be more than a star He's already averaging like 21, 7, and 5 with almost 60 true shooting through his first four playoff games. And this is what a true number two looks like to your superstar MVP caliber player in Shea Gilgis Alexander. Chet Holmgren was spectacular. And god damn it, Reggie Miller, can you fucking pronounce players' names right? It's Chet Holmgren, not Holmgrum. Holmgrum, really? You've been announcing games for 20 years. You just can't get the pronunciation right. It's like with the Wimbenyama thing, man. People kept saying Wimbenyana all year. And I'm like, guys, we've had three fucking years to pronounce this guy's name right. It's Wimbenyama. But now Reggie Miller apparently thinks Chet Holmgren is Chet Holmgrum. Even Mike Holmgren, the legendary NFL football coach. Like, we've had Holmgrens in sports before. Why is it so hard to... Anyway, whatever. Josh Giddy also had a really good series in this one. I actually think if teams defend Josh Giddy the way they do in these playoffs, which is what happened to the Pelicans a few times, they left Josh Giddy open, you know, and it, he made some threes in the last few games compared to the early part of the series. But if the Thunder take Josh Giddy off the floor, they could just insert Isaiah Joe, Case and Wallace, Aaron Wiggins, even Gordon Hayward in a pinch, but it doesn't look like Hayward has any juice. I'm actually really disappointed in how that trade played out. But do teams really want to try to make Oklahoma City take Josh Giddy off the floor? Because then you're bringing in a two way player that could shoot, attack a closeout, is athletic. This Thunder team is tough, man. I was really impressed with the Thunder and the Timberwolves. They took care of business immediately. They should get all the respect now because both teams came in with questions. Oklahoma City, oh, is the moment going to be too big for them, blah, 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 which I always thought was kind of lazy. I thought more of the problem was not so much inexperience, but can they rebound? What are they going to do with Josh Giddy? Now, the Pelicans also didn't have Zion, but I still think the Thunder handled business like a number one seed should. They were the better team, they had more talent, and they played more disciplined, and they swept. And now they get to face the winner of Clippers Mavericks, where both teams are literally just taking turns punching each other in the face. So if you're a Thunder fan, you gotta be happy about that. As far as the Pelicans go, like I said, they have to do something with C.J. McCollum and Brandon Ingram. 
now I'm doing the Reggie Miller thing. They have to do something with CJ McCollum and Brandon Ingram in the offseason and make this fully Zion's team with a bunch of wings around it because I think Trey Murphy's going to be awesome. Herb Jones is going to be, well, he already is awesome. He's a 40% 3 and D wing. That is literally probably the best wing defender in the NBA. A wing that I know a lot of media members every year are going to try to argue for defensive player of the year, even though I don't think Herb Jones will ever win one. They have a lot of talent and they have assets and they could get more assets and team building stuff if they just get off of CJ and Brandon Ingram because I don't think the fit long term is going to equal championship unless you completely build around Zion. And I just feel bad for Zion, man. He did everything we asked him to. We saw that December, which culminated in that Lakers in-season tournament game. He was clearly out of shape, clearly was out of shape to start the season, and he did everything we asked him to do. He got in shape. He lost 25 pounds. The Pelicans started playing him more at point guard. He played 70 games, which was by far a career high. He was really on track. And then what a story it would have been if the Pelicans had beaten the Lakers in the play-in game off of a giant Zion performance where he had a 40-point double-double, only for it to be cut short in the last two minutes of the game by injury. If he had to finish that game and led the Pelicans to victory, that would have been a great storybook. Not ending, but kind of like a redemption moment because they, he beat the team that kind of exposed him in the in-season tournament and led to all the scrutiny. Just would have been nice, but I feel bad for the kid. But it's very clear now Ingram needs to go. CJ McCollum needs to go eventually because we've seen all the memes on Twitter. That dude is playing more like Jaleel White than CJ McCollum. <laughs> but I do like the Pelicans foundation. I think I talked about it after they beat the Kings in one of the in-season tournament games earlier this year. I mean, the Pelicans just decimated the Kings this year in the regular season series and in the play-in. But just the plethora of wings that they have from Herb Jones to Dyson Daniels to Trey Murphy to Najee Marshall then you got Jose Alvarado I really like Jose Alvarado he was injured quite a bit in this series but I still like him Jordan Hawkins one of the best rookie shooters to come out in a while the Pelicans have a bright future they just need to clear the runway for it to be completely Zion's team now and give him some additional help like the Thunder really I'm so jealous of the Thunder because this is exactly how I thought the process with the Philadelphia 76ers would have played out in my head if Sam Hinkie was allowed would have been allowed to continue with the experiment but that Thunder slash Clippers slash Mav series that's gonna be fire and I guess we should talk about Clippers Mavs real briefly before I go. Really sucks that Kawhi Leonard's not playing, man. And it's really clear that he should not have been on the court in those two games. Game two, I thought he looked a little bit more spry, but game three, he was just not himself. Line drives on the few shot attempts he had. Just the jumper was just flat. And Kawhi Leonard usually has a flat line type of jumper, but you could tell he did not have any lift in that knee or his jumper or really in any facet of his game and that kind of I felt like that played a part in the Clippers you know losing those two games not to say obviously that the Clippers are better without Kawhi Leonard that's fucking stupid but it's very clear that a 40 percent 50 percent Kawhi Leonard was not helping the Clippers so he's ruled out indefinitely the Clippers won game four and shout out to James Harden, man, because in this very series where, you know, a Dallas broadcaster called out James Harden after the trade famously in a viral clip, James Harden in this series right now is averaging 26 points a game, seven assists, four rebounds, 50% shooting from three on over eight and a half attempts per game, 54% shooting from the field overall nearly 60% on his twos, and he's just hitting 
floater after floater after floater. I saw a crazy stat that James Harden made like 12 floaters in the regular season. He made five in the last game alone that I counted. And he just kept attacking Luka. It's just funny seeing the Clippers and Mavs do the Spider-Man pointing meme thing. Where they're like, alright, we're going to attack Luka. Alright, we're going to attack James Harden. And by the way, Luka has done incredibly well when he's been hunted in these playoffs. He's defended really well. But it's just very funny to see both teams going back and forth. Paul George also, I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, his two best games came when, you know, Kawhi was out and he was thrusted into the first primary option role as the wing scorer. James Harden is the point guard, if you get what I'm saying. But Paul George is now sliding into that first option from the wing position and he was just awesome in this game. Did it score much in the third quarter? He had a blistering first half, but he did make some big shots in the fourth quarter when the Mavericks were making their run, and it looked like a classic. Oh no, here comes the Clippers collapsing again. And the two most unlikely guys, the guys that get roasted for their playoff performances, though I think some of that is overblown, they saved the Clippers season. Kyrie Irving has been awesome in this series. Luka Doncic, by the way, has not been shooting well in this series, and I know he's basically averaging a triple-double, but his shooting has been bad, and he needs to play more like the first two Clippers series in his career because if he doesn't, the Mavericks are going to flat-out lose. But this is a great series so far, and I was also really confused as to why Jason Kidd didn't put any length at the rim because they were clearly top locking Harden to let him go right and Harden obliged and Harden scored every time or made the right play and I just felt like having Maxi Kleba back there when you're trying to run that type of scheme on Harden was just a bad decision by Jason Kidd that's the other advantage the Clippers have in this series is they just have the better coach so it is an interesting back and forth we will see who wins game five. Stay tuned for my next video. I'm going to be reacting to Cavaliers magic because the Cavaliers were fucking pathetic in their last two games. Absolutely fucking pathetic in a series that they handpicked themselves, that they intentionally threw a regular season game for to get this matchup. And they got the doors blown off of them in Orlando in games three and four. I am very interested to see how they respond in a big time game five tonight because of, like I said, if the Cavs get eliminated in the first round after handpicking their opponent, some changes are going to be made.